All right. Good morning or afternoon or possibly evening, depending on where you are. Um, Matt Tassaro, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Defect Dojo Inc. We, we actually took an OWASP project and made a company out of it, which has been pretty cool. I'm also a member of the OWASP Global Board of Directors, and I'm moderating this keynote. So I do have to say I'm very excited to see a global AppSec in Singapore. I think it's about time, and it's pretty darn cool. Um, first off, I just wanted to thank all the attendees. It's you attendees that make these events happen. So thank you very much for participating. We really, really appreciate it. And it's really that community, that larger, broader community that makes OWASP what it is today. So thanks for being part of our community. Uh, I'd also like to thank the OWASP staff. Uh, they help herd the cats, which are the inevitable <laughs> people in the community that they do have to herd and they have a thankless job. And so I'd like to at least give them a little bit of thanks for all they do for us. Uh, thanks to the speakers, including our wonderful keynote tonight, who get to spread knowledge uh, for all of us and make us a little bit smarter along the way. And then thanks also to the sponsors who support the OWASP Foundation and provide tools, techniques, uh, solutions to help our AppSec lives just a little bit better. Um, a, a quick operational note before we really get into things, if you do want to ask questions or ask something of our keynote, please use the chat in Whova to ask questions to the keynote. And so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Asankhya Sharma, co-founder and CTO of Patched Codes. He set himself a very small goal of automatically fixing every software vulnerability in code. So props to him for taking on that challenge. He's got a great depth of knowledge and experience in both software and uh, technology in general. Today is gonna be talking to us about LVMs LLMs, excuse me, and generative AI to help fix our uh, problems in our software. Um, I don't want you, I'm very eager to hear this. I was super happy to be asked to, to moderate this keynote because I actually quite wanted to hear it anyway. So without further delay, let's kick things off right and start our first keynote. So Asankhya, take it away. Thank you, Matt, for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, and I'll just quickly share my screen. So. Uh, and thanks, OWASP, for giving this uh, opportunity for me to do this keynote. And I agree, it's high time the OWASP, uh, you know, AppSec conference uh, came to Singapore. So I'm happy to present on a topic which I'm really passionate about, uh, and I've worked on uh, on and off for about three or four years now, which is how we can use LLMs and generative AI to fix uh, software vulnerabilities, right? Uh, so I've actually spent half of my life and, you know, most of my last two decades of professional career working uh, in the AppSec industry, mostly trying to build security tools for developers, right? So maybe if you've not heard of me, I hope you've heard of some of the tools that I've built in the past, including back in the day, uh, cat.net, or more recently, you know, the source clear SCA agent or autofix, right? Uh, but what I want to talk about today is three things. First, I want to recap a little bit about how application security has evolved uh, over the last two decades how some vulnerabilities are still persistent, even though how we build software has changed uh, quite a bit. Then I wanna talk a bit about what has happened in the last uh, one or two years, which is the rise of uh, Gen AI and uh, large language models. And then finally, hopefully, I'll be able to convince you that uh, we can think about an alternate paradigm in terms of fixing vulnerabilities and aim to go towards a more developer-less security. So let me jump right in. Uh, and talk about uh, the evolution of AppSec. And I thought, what better way to start than, you know, just uh, start off with the project OWASP is most famous for, which is the OWASP top 10, right? And this is the uh, list from 2021, which is the most recent version, right? But if you look at how this OWASP top 10 list of uh, AppSec uh, vulnerabilities evolved over the years, uh, right from the first list, which was published in 2003, you'll notice at least two things. One is that Vulnerabilities are very persistent in terms of types of vulnerabilities. So for example, injection flaws have been around since, I don't know, the very beginning. And uh, even though new vulnerability types keep coming in, uh, many of them are actually still in the top 10, right? So, and this has happened over a large, you know, in a period of two decades, right? So it's not like uh, two or three uh, years or something. So, and if you think about how software has evolved in, uh, or how we build software has evolved in these two decades, it's really surprising the fact that we still keep making the same kind of mistakes. So we still keep making the same kind of errors when we build and design software, right? Now, uh, we have witnessed major changes in software development uh, just 
try to recap a few here. Uh, we've seen a big shift from proprietary software to open source. We have seen shifts from you know on-prem to cloud computing, uh, building monolith apps to assembling uh, services using APIs. And also uh, we have tried to broke down the, uh, the silos that exist within development teams, whether it comes to development, operations, QA, and move towards a more DevOps philosophy, right? So this has enabled us to build really large complex piece of software. Uh, and we have gotten a lot better at you know, avoiding vulnerabilities in software, but uh, still we have the same problems in some sense what we had you know, 20 years ago. And uh, I would like to dwell into two particular trends here. One is the DevSecOps, another is about shift left. So I'm sure all of you must have seen uh, you know, charts like this where uh, either this infinity symbol or these overlapping Venn diagrams, right? Where we say, okay, we have uh, with increased automation, we have sharing of responsibilities, we can actually do a lot more. Uh, and then we can include security as part of the uh, cycle. And then we can have, you know, all of this uh, together and we can manage it as part of one process with the, uh, uh, as part of DevSecOps, right? Now, often to imagine the future, it's good to actually look at uh, what trends are there today and take an extreme position of it, right? So if you imagine how we went from maybe silos of DevOps testing to DevOps to DevSecOps, uh, what is the future, what the future might look like, right? So there are certainly more uh, activities or tasks that you need to do as part of building software. So how many circles can you add in and how, what the overlapping circles would look like? And at the end, the intersection might, what that intersection might be, right? So if I think about it for a second, we don't want to our ops to evolve in this way, uh, but uh, there are certainly more activities that we do in order to build and support software, which uh, could be automated to an extent uh, which is not done today, right? So if a year ago you asked me like, is it really possible that we can do all of this together in one place and just supported by process people and uh, automation? I would have said maybe not. Uh, but in the last year or so, we have seen tremendous improvement in uh, autonomous agents or generative uh, autonomous agents. And I do think that in the near future, it is possible to automate all of that as part of you know uh, autonomous aging making decisions completely uh, with lit minimal human intervention, right? Or maybe a generative agent ops. So I'll park that thought in your mind and talk about the second trend, which I mentioned, which is around shift left. Uh, so the idea here being that if you can focus the security team and the tooling earlier in the development cycle compared to where it's typically applied, you can reduce the overall cost of fixing security uh, defects as well as the number of defects that happen, right? So uh, I know people talk about shift left, shift right, shift everywhere, but I think everybody agrees that doing a more uh, of this earlier in the cycle can actually help you reduce the cost of fixing defects overall, right? Or flatten this uh, particular curve. Uh, but what it means is that we are actually putting increasingly more and more burden at the development stage of the cycle or at developers, right? And if anything, the last 20 years uh, have taught me that developers don't really care about security, no matter how much we want them to, no matter how much we try. And we've spent a lot of time and effort building security tools for developers. Uh, but I think finally it's time to do something different or really flip the paradigm and talk about building developer tools for security tasks. With that, I'll jump into the second part of my uh, talk today, which is on the rise and hype of generative AI. Now, we will focus ourselves today only on what we call like code large language models, because uh, we really want to figure out how to fix vulnerabilities. And in this space, uh, if you think about open AI, uh, how they have evolved their offering or language model, they started earlier, uh, a year and a half ago with Codex, which was a 12 billion parameter LLM which they piloted with GitHub Copilot. Uh, it was a auto-completion uh, or you know left to right uh, code uh, generation model. So you could just give it a doc string or a piece of code and then it would try to fill up what would come next in just uh, in an auto-complete way. But if you look at how that has evolved, they went from a model which can do code generation to a model which is fine-tuned to follow instructions to a model which is chatty. So this is really the model behind uh, chat GPT all the way over to GPT-4. And in tandem, they have evolved their offering for developers from you know, just doing Copilot, which does code generation to Copilot for business. All the way, most recent one is the Copilot X, which actually allows you to chat uh, with your code in the terminal or in the IDE, and it uses GPT-4, right? So two trends to look here. One is that uh, initially they did train model only on code, but I think over a period of time, they realized that a model uh, or an LLM, which is good at code, uh, related tasks is a model that is good in general. So from the 
the code da vinci there was another text da vinci where they had a separation between natural language versus code but since uh, chat gpt or gpt 3.5 it's just the same model right so uh, if you are looking to build a model which can do good uh, reasoning on code it needs to be a model which is good in general so it needs to be trained on natural language text as well right second thing to note is that uh, it's already very useful so when they introduced it a year or half ago i think they did some studies with the uh, developers and because they can track how many uh, suggestions are accepted by developers in the id so after the first 3 or 4 months of users of copilot uh, almost one third of the suggestions that the tool gives are accepted by the developer right so uh, in terms of their productivity or task in terms of gain of productivity after 3 or 4 months of continuous use developers are already accepting almost one third of suggestions that come from these kind of models Right. Now, I wish I could uh, recap the history of this for open uh, source models, uh, but there are just so many, and uh, it'll take a whole talk to do that. Earlier this year in April, I did do a talk like this at FOSS Asia. I think it's on YouTube. I'll just refer you to that. Today, what I'll do is I'll just uh, recap a few models which have come up since uh, April of this year. Right. So the for a very uh, until very recently. Uh, the model which was really good and open was star coder so this is backed by big code uh, consortium it is a bunch of companies including hugging face service now and a large group of uh, researchers the good thing about this model is it's trained on an open uh, dataset called the stack which is a 6.4 tv source code dataset pulled up from github which is consists only of uh, code which is permissively licensed and then they also have an opt out now you'll see that i purposefully do not refer to this model and others here as open source because what has happened in uh, llms is that uh, uh, whatever models have come up they most often do not meet the definition of open source as defined by osi uh, but for our purposes we call a model open if the weights of the model are available like in the case of star coder and also if the data set on which it was trained is also available so open access data set and open access uh, weights and then we call the model open uh, that is as good as it gets because nobody is actually releasing models which would meet the definition of open source uh, uh, per osi uh, what the good thing about this model is you'll notice is that compared to the how open ai is uh, offering as evolved uh, it validated the fact that in order to build a good code llm you need to train on natural language text so they started with uh, training the model on 1 trillion uh, tokens to create star coder base and then they further trained on additional 30 billion tokens of python now why python uh, i don't know maybe one of the reasons is that most of the benchmarks to evaluate llms uh, do it on a benchmark which is based on python code so you'll see that quite often that uh, people would actually train further on python just to score good on the benchmarks uh, but more importantly what they realize is that you have to train on natural language text if you want to get a model which is good at reasoning uh, just training on code is not enough so what it means is that you cannot really build a very strong code llm by training only on source code you do have to mix it with some amount of natural language and then finally it was fine tuned to uh, add chattiness to it uh, or instruction following uh, by training it on a version of uh, open assistant data set right so for a for a brief period of time this was the uh, you know best performing uh, open code llm but i like to mention one more model before i go to uh, what has happened in like just in the last uh, two months which is code t5 so i mentioned uh, uh, t5 plus i mentioned it for two reasons one because it's also built by a team right here in singapore the salesforce uh, the ai research team which sits in singapore actually built this model second it's architecturally different from some of the other models in the fact that it has a both encoder and decoder within the same uh, model architecture most of the models that you see including gpt are a decoder only model why that is useful i'll talk about it in a later slide but just to let you know that it is a different architecture it allows you to avoid some cost on or time on pre training because you can start off uh, your model initialize with weights on other existing models which is what they did they took a previously trained code gen model which the salesforce team has built and then they just continued training on top of it right and then they fine tuned it uh, using data generated by open ai's api to create instruct code t5 now by our definition this particular model will not be open because the data set is you know, not open and it's explicitly trained on uh, open ai's uh, api which uh, makes it commercially unviable uh, but nevertheless for a brief period of time instruct code t5 was the best uh, performing open model right and now to coming to the point of what has happened in just last two months which is uh, code llama so meta actually released a, a very strong foundational uh, model for code called code llama that really changed the game 
Now, when I, if you look at the abstract, uh, which I had submitted originally for this talk, you'll see I only mentioned star coder because really these things did not exist when I was uh, submitting it back in uh, first week of uh, August, right? Uh, so here you'll foresee the similar kind of pipeline, which is now pretty standard to create a strong code model, which is you train on some natural language text. So they started with Llama 2, which is trained on text. They did additional training for code, then some Python uh, training to make sure you perform good on benchmarks. And then some long context fine tuning, uh, which is a special property. So they actually increase the context size from 4K to 16K. And finally, some instruction fine tuning to add chattiness or ability to follow instructions, right? So any model that you want to build or train yourself will need to go through some of these steps. I think it's pretty established by now. So it's practically impossible for uh, you know individual teams or others to actually pre-train a model because it's a lot of effort. So for most of us, we'll, act, we'll end up using one of these models which are available uh, for our downstream tasks. Now I kept saying that this is a strong model, this is a weak model, or you know this model is better than the other. But how do we actually evaluate code LLMs? So it turns out most of the evaluation we mentioned something called human eval, uh, which is a data set of 164 handwritten Python programs with unit tests to check functional correctness. So examples uh, from this data set include things like this. So increment list. Uh, so there'll be a function prototype and then some doc string, which will have some tests in it. And the part in yellow is what the model is supposed to output. And then it'll be verified to check whether it follows all the tests when you do the synthesis. So this was originally introduced by OpenAI two, three years ago in their paper on evaluating large language model trained on code. But uh, it has become the standard for better or worse. So every code element that we uh, people publish, they usually tend to evaluate first on human eval. Now, if we look at how it stands today when it comes to closed versus open model, this is kind of how it looks like. So GPT-4 is still the strongest performing model uh, on human eval. Uh, here, zero shot means that you do not do any prompting. You just take the model as it is and do completion uh, as compared to one shot or two shot where you may give some examples. Pass at one means you only take one generation. So typically earlier people used to report pass at one and pass at 10 results. So where you sample 10 outputs and then you compare how many of those are there. Uh, but the models have gotten better. So now we are just reporting pass at one. So GPT-4 is already at 86. You see Code Llama at 53. And then I mentioned Star Coder till, uh, you know, before the, uh, August 1st to second week when uh, Code Llama was released was the best performing model and then Instruct Code. So in this space of you know, open versus closed, we are somewhere here. We have not really reached the point. Most people expect over a period of time, open models to become better at uh, various tasks. But as of today, uh, Unfortunately or fortunately, GPT-4 is a uh, best model for a variety of tasks, including uh, for tasks requiring uh, code or source code or bug fixing or vulnerability remediation, right? Now, but things change very rapidly in the open uh, source world. And to give you an example, there's this uh, leaderboard from uh, Hugging Face where they evaluate models continuously and people are free to submit their models. And just since Code Llama came in the last two months, you'll notice that at least two groups have managed to improve a uh, lot further on the baseline. So one is the Wizard Coder, which is a group uh, based out of uh, Microsoft Research Lab Beijing, and another is a startup called Fine, right? So they took Code Llama uh, 34B Python and they further fine-tuned it to achieve uh, much, much better results uh, on the human eval benchmark. So today for code generation, if you really have an option, uh, these are the kind of models which are available. So you have GPT-4, which is still the best, and then you have Fine, Wizard Coder, and Code Llama. Now Fine and Wizard Coder are highlighted because they don't meet our definition of open because the data sets are not available. And uh, Wizard Coder explicitly has been trained on the output of uh, OpenAI uh, API, so which makes it commercially unviable. Uh, but it's there, so it just shows that it's possible to actually take an open model, uh, fine tune it to reach a point where uh, it can rival or gets close to GPT-4 in performance. Now, I've talked so much about code generation, but really what we're interested in is to fix vulnerabilities, right? So how do you actually take a model which can generate code to do vulnerability fixing? So there are a couple of ways. One is you could train the pre-train the model on a different task instead of causal left to right language modeling. You could do mass language modeling where the model is supposed to fill the gaps in the text, or you could do uh, fill in the middle kind of training. But even if you haven't, what you can do is you can trick the model with just code generation to do uh, infilling. So the way it typically works is for fixing bugs or vulnerabilities, you have some code before, you have some more code, and what you're doing is you want to make your change in the middle, right? So you can include additional tokens, which would define the prefix, the suffix, and then the middle. And then this is just to train the model to generate code from here. So in the training set, you split it this way and then just generate the code at the end. And then you can take this token and then put it back in, right? So you can trick a model which can do code generation to do infilling uh, by fine tuning it further with additional uh, uh, sentinel tokens. 
Now, if you do that, you can use it to fix vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the ways you could do it is you can prompt it like this. So remember, this is a model which is just code generation. So you can't tell it like, hey, fix this for me or chat with it or do instructions. So you will have to put it in comments. So one way to do it is something like this, which is uh, in this particular, originally the code was this, where it has a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability. And then the fix is to uh, uh, escape the message uh, parameter, right? So you could, and this is a warning which is given by say a static analyzer, right? So you put the bug, the type of bug, and then you comment the buggy line. And then you say, okay, fixed. And then ask the model to generate code or fill up the text here. And it, hopefully it will fill up something that fixes it. Right? Now, why this particular prompt? Because in this paper on examining zero shot vulnerability repair with LLMs, uh, they tried a variety of prompts and what they found was like something like this works well in practice. Uh, to fix the number of vulnerabilities, right? So if you can use this to fix vulnerability, how much further can you go? So if you think about the whole roadmap of uh, what I promised in the abstract, which is uh, fix uh, vulnerabilities to the extent or rivaling what a developer in your team would do, it looks something like this. So there are many different steps to reach there. We're doing just pure code generation or tricking the model to do infilling can take you up to you know 30 percent uh, of the fixes but beyond that there's still a lot more room to uh, work with and hopefully for the rest of the talk uh, i will try to go through this and try to take you through a variety of techniques and tricks that you can use in order to rule as close as possible to 100 now this uh, percentages they're not built by any scientific study or data is just based on experience uh, and later i'll show you some uh, studies that others have done uh, which uh, tells us that why this rule of thumb is a good uh, good thing to uh, go with, right? Uh, but remember what our end goal is. Our end goal is to fix vulnerabilities in the same way like a developer would do, which means it has to be across multiple steps. It may have to go across multiple files. It may have to work for an enterprise's private code and so on, right? Now, doing code generation and tricking it to do infilling for bug fixing is great, but if you want to do just bug fixing, it's actually much harder if you think about it, right? So you don't want to tell ideally the model like where the bug is, what is the thing, and then fix it. What you want is something that would do this, which is, hey, fix this bug in this particular function Fibonacci, and then the model should be able to take the input uh, code and then return the code, which is fixed, right? So if you'll notice that to do, in order to do this, you can't just do it with a model which is trained on code. You need an LLM that can follow instructions or is chatty in the sense you can actually chat with us, right? So that means you can't use pure code generation LLMs to do bug fixing this way. Now, the second question is you could further fine tune it to do it, but then how do you get the data? So what is a good source of instruction data for code LLMs? Um, our paper recently called Octopack uh, showed how you can do instruction uh, tuning for code large, uh, uh, large language models. And they proposed a new data set, which is based on human eval called human eval fix. Uh, what they did is they took every single solution in human eval uh, and added one bug, uh, handwritten. And the bug is written in such a way that the code still runs, will produce an incorrect result to at least one unit test would fail, right? So an example is given here on the left. So this is uh, from the human eval. Uh, the method has closed uh, elements in this uh, list. Now there is actually a bug here that uh, the element could be less than element two. And then in this case, it could be negative. So the fix is actually to use the absolute. Uh, but one of the test cases here given, so you have the original human eval function, then you have an introduced bug, and then you have a test case which fails. And all you want to do is the, the benchmark actually asks the model, fix bugs in this particular method, and that's it, right? And the output, ideal output or the correct output is the fixed uh, code here, right? So they propose a new uh, eval fix benchmark. You'll notice that now you can't just do code generation. You actually need a model which can follow instructions. So you had some sort of instruction in it. So even if you're using GPT-4, you have to tell the model what needs to be done, right? And they evaluated on a number of uh, models. So for example, GPT-4 on this benchmark uh, reaches 47%, which is way, way less than 86. So this uh, confirms our suspicion that bug fixing is harder than pure code generation. And if you look at open uh, models, you have code llama, which is 33, then visit coder and find it in various places, right? Uh, but if this is a good benchmark to do this, the next question is, uh, how do we actually tune a model or how do we, there's a big gap between code llama and GPT-4, right? How can we do better uh, to do this? So the answer is you could do fine tuning, but what exactly would be a good data set for it? So you could write it by hand, but that's not gonna scale really well, right? But in a previous work, we have actually noticed that commits are a good data source for uh, understanding how software evolves because they capture the longitudinal history uh, of how changes happen one after the other, right? So if you look at a commit, what it does, it has some code before, there is some commit message, 
guaranteed many of them are not good but if you could filter them out uh, you could get a uh, instruction tuning data set which is very good which is you have some code before you have some code after and then hopefully you have an instruction which tells what happened to the code before so that it was changed to code after right so in the past we have done a lot of work to curate these kind of data sets in particular our paper on uh, machine learning approach for vulnerability curation uh, in the msr 2020 uh, we won the six of distinguished paper award for curating a data set of commits uh, so we have some experience in doing it but today in fact there are actually open uh, uh, data sets available in particular bitcode had released a data set called commit pack ft uh, which contains only high quality commit messages that resemble natural language instructions so what we did over the last uh, month or so is we took code llama uh, 34b python and we fine tuned it on this data set right and we fine tuned it in, in a way that would explicitly take into account the commit so we fine tuned the way to prompt the patch coder model is to give it an instruction which is where we put the commit message and then give some input, which is the code before, and then the model is supposed to give the response, right? So this is the patch, the code before and code after. So the model is open, that's available in Hugging Phase, and the data set is also open. So it meets our definition of you know, open uh, access and open uh, data model. Now, once we did this, uh, we tried to check how it performs on bug fixing. So as of today, because things change really rapidly, Patch Coder is the state-of-the-art open code LLM for uh, bug fixing and code generation. So what we see is that from the model which we fine tuned on, we don't lose much in terms of pure code generation. It is at least as competitive as that. But on human eval fix, we gain uh, up to eight eight or nine percentage points. So we are actually uh, close to 41.34 uh, compared to GPT's uh, 47, right? Now, if you can do instruction tuning and you can that you can use to do bug fixing, then you can go up till you know somewhere around 30 to 45% of the vulnerabilities. But we still haven't really talked about anything explicitly related to vulnerability, right? So the next step in this uh, roadmap of fixing uh, software vulnerabilities at developers is how do we actually do it so that it, uh, we incorporate some security context inside uh, the fix? Because there are some of the vulnerability fixes are gonna be very, very specific. Uh, if bug fixing is a more general task, uh, resolving vulnerabilities is specific because vulnerability is a particular type of bug, right? So in order to evaluate this, there is no benchmark that exists today. So we created one ourselves. And in order to be realistic, we used a, a completely automated process to create and evaluate the benchmark uh, on real Python open source project from the top thousand. So we took 76 Python programs where each file has exactly one vulnerability as reported by a particular static analyzer, right? So we call it static analysis eval because we parameterize on the static analyzer. Because I worked in this space in the past and one of the common uh, uh, confusions is when you present this is like people say, okay, you said this is a vulnerability, but it's actually a false positive. You use a better analyzer, you'll see that it doesn't exist, right? So in order to avoid all of that, we say you parameterize it on a static analyzer, use the same analyzer, use the same LLM. Hopefully you'll get the same results because there's no change, right? So here's an example of how this, uh, an example from the uh, static analysis eval looks like. So it's a full program. Uh, there is a vulnerability because you are opening uh, this path here. Uh, you're putting the request content into the path which is controlled by the user, right? So, and this flagged by a static analyzer. During evaluation, we again scan with the analyzer. We extract from the output of the analyzer something we believe would be returned by almost every analyzer, so not something very specific. So either the type of vulnerability like CWE, vulnerable line and error message. And using that, we construct a prompt, which looks something like this. So this is the error message, fix this vulnerability in this line, input code, and then the model is supposed to fill in the fixed code, right? How do we know it's fixed? Well, you could review it, or what we do is we actually use the same analyzer to check again and see if the error message goes away. And for those where the message goes away, we review it by hand, right? Now, if you follow this process to evaluate on static analysis eval, uh, you'll see that uh, GPT-4 is still the best model, which, uh, as close to 55% of the cases. Uh, patch coder is uh, the best open model with just around 51 to 32, 51.32% uh, of the cases. Now, what did we add from the bug fixing? All we added is just really the context. We didn't really fine tune it on any vulnerability related data. We just used the same uh, model, which is fine tuned on commits. And then all we did is we added some security context in form of the prompt. And that also comes from the output of the analyzer. So it's not coming, uh, from somebody else, it's just completely automated, right? So with this, you can actually resolve vulnerabilities effectively. So going from a model which is instruction tuned to a model where you can prompt it in the right security context will take you up to 50, 55% uh, of vulnerability fixes, right? Now the rest of this is things or tricks which you need to do which are independent of the model you use. So 
how do you do it in a private code or an enterprise code? How do you do across files with many steps? You could use it with any model. So uh, you could use it with GPT-4, you could use it with patch coder, you could use it with any other model and see improvements in it, right? Because these are actually set of tricks. Now, what do I mean by private code? So you'll realize that it often in an enterprise, the fix for a vulnerability where they've written a lot of proprietary code may not reside in something that uh, is outside or in open source, right? It may use types or things which are specific to that code base. And how do you do this? Because if you take a model which is trained, uh, they don't have any memory of your code base, right? So one way to do it is to use what is known as retrieval augmented generation. So this is an example of hopefully you've seen some diagrams like this for people who build apps uh, for you know, chatting with PDFs or chat with your own documents, right? So the way it works in natural languages, you have some set of data or documents internal to your organization. You use a kind of another kind of LLM called embedding LLM, which is uh, an encoder. So you take the text, you encode it into vectors and store it in a special DB called a vector DB, which is capable of doing similarity queries. So at query time or at inference, the user comes in with a query, instead of using that directly to put into a prompt into your chat LLM, you retrieve some information from the vector DB. So you find the top one, top three similar documents, stitch them together with the query to build the prompt, and then you ask your chat LLM to do the generation, right? So that's why it's known as retrieval augmented uh, generation. And this is one way to extend the memory of the model uh, beyond what it's uh, originally trained for, right? So if you want to add new information to the model, one way to do it is to use this, right? Now we could do something similar for code. Um, and I mentioned, I'll talk about uh, why code T5 plus is uh, unique, is that is the model which has both encoder and decoder in the same architecture. So you can do end-to-end -end retrieval augmented code generation with the same model. And to give you an example of why this makes a difference, if you look at a prompt here, and this is taken from their paper, which says download a HTTP resource from a URL and save it to destination, capable of dealing with zip compressed content, right? If you just do generation without doing any retrieval, uh, you'll notice that it just you know creates a method, but it doesn't do anything to handle zip content, right? On the other hand, if you could do a retrieval, you find some existing piece of code where there was a download file, it tells the model that there are things like URL lib. So instead of using the URL open, you could actually use a particular library and there are other things you could do. So if you combine these two together and then do generation, it actually finally manages to create the code that you originally intended. So it downloads a file, but it also is able to, it uses a library and it's also able to deal with zip file content, right? So doing retrieval augmented code generation does actually allow you to uh, generate code, which is much better. Now, when it comes to, the, in the text, it's very easy because it's just either summaries or natural text or paragraphs. There are different ways to do it. So it's when it comes to code, there are at least two or three different ways you could do retrieval. One is unimodal in terms of the text or the code. The other is bimodal. So where you take a code and you can retrieve a summary or you take a summary and then you can retrieve the code. Uh, but what works much better than that, and especially in the context of what we've done in Patch Coder, is bimodal with context. So what we do is, remember our... Uh, we always have an instruction at a before and an after port pair. So we first, so this is what we want to fix. This is the instruction as uh, done with some security context, right? So we first take the instruction and then try to retrieve all the similar commit messages from the code base, which actually are similar to this particular instruction. They're actually trying to fix this kind of CV, CWE, right? Then we retrieve the similar vulnerable code, which is similar to the input vulnerable code to find the context in which this particular vulnerability was introduced and what was the retrieve fix. And then we use this entire thing as a prompt and then ask the model to generate code, right? So the good thing about RAG is that you can use it to do few short uh, prompts. So here I'm just showing you one, which is like the most similar, top one similar commit, top one similar vulnerable code, but you could actually do a few prompts. You could do two or three prompts. So you could take buggy code, fix code, buggy code, fix code, and then ask your uh, input buggy code, right? So you can use this information to give it some examples of how the bugs have been fixed in your particular code base or in a private code base, and then ask the model to generate the fix. And hopefully it will generate the fix, which is uh, much more specific to uh, your code or a private code. Now, one concern you may have at times is that, okay, great, you're doing it, you're indexing private code. Uh, what if you actually leak some types or variables which are specific to your organization, right? If you do it, so what? There are actually ways to obfuscate it, and I worked in the past on this, where you can still preserve the essence of the fig uh, by doing some simple tricks. So for example, here, you'll notice that this uh, uh, um, resolver uh, object, uh, so this is actually a fix for a null pointer dereference. So you check that it's not null, and then you return it. 
Now, if you want to preserve these types, you don't want them to leak, you could actually obfuscate it something like this. It will still preserve essentially the structural fix, which is that I have a variable two of class three, which I check for null uh, dereference before I actually return. So you could still use, it is still a useful fix for the model. And it actually preserves the types of the, that might be specific or private to the organization. So there are simple ways to obfuscate to preserve structural fixes like this. Now, how much further can you get ahead with doing this, right? And I told you that the roadmap that I'm showing you that based on rule of thumbs, uh, but uh, this paper from uh, Microsoft Research called Inferred Fix, they actually tried it on a real code base and they noticed something very similar. So first see that codex, which is just a completion model in our thing it will be called code generation. Uh, and this NPD is null pointer dereference. So it's able to fix 6%, then an instruction model, which in our case for bug fixing, it's like Da Vinci, 40.5, then further fine tuning. And finally with RAG, you can reach all the way up to 60%, right? So at least in this study, you can go from 60 to 82% of the uh, uh, vulnerabilities can be fixed by following this. And you will notice that this progression, which I'm showing you in the uh, roadmap is actually still valid. So you go from zero to uh, 16 to 30 to 70 to 80%, right? I'll refer you to this paper. They have some other interesting ideas there as well. So hopefully with RAG, you can actually get close to 60, 75% of the vulnerabilities, right? And this also allows you to pull in inside your context things which are uh, temporal. So if something happened in the past or you fixed the bug in a past in the similar way, you are able to use that information in your LLM and generate a fix today, which is specific, right? Now, how do we do it across multiple files, uh, which is spatially, right? Now, one, why you might need it is is the same uh, example. So this is where we're calling this method get resources over, and there could be a potential null pointer dereference here. Now the static analyzer may give you a warning here, but the actual fix might be in the method definition, right? So what you want to do in these cases is not pull up the previous thing, but pull up other things in the space in terms of the current code base, other files which are relevant to the fixing of the vulnerabilities. So you want to pull up all related code, and the related code might be something very simple, like in this case. Uh, method uh, definition uh, which you need to add in, or it could be something more complicated. So I've seen people do try and attempt to do things like this with GPT-4, which is they just give it the whole file structure, and then they ask the model itself, what more do you need, what more do you need, and so on, right? Unfortunately, this is not likely to work really well because as we know, uh, LLMs are not really very good in uh, relational reasoning. So in fact, there's this recent paper talks about the reversal curse where a model trained on A is B, doesn't learn that B is A, right? And if you want to do even simple call graph analysis, you do want the ability to say that if A is called by B, then B is calling A and so on. Uh, but thankfully uh, for us, I have a PhD in static analysis. So my method to do this is to actually use uh, this analysis outside the LLM. Uh, in particular, uh, there are like a couple of types of analysis you can do which are useful. So one is the reachability analysis, uh, which uh, we have done in the past for, in the context of uh, SCA. Um, so you could actually, so for example, in this case, the method that is changed has an additional parameter. So everywhere this method is called, you want to pull it into the context because the fix may involve uh, adding another uh, uh, reference to the call of the method. So you can do that with reachability, or you can also do impact analysis, which is very useful in API migration. So if you are going and upgrading your uh, library from a version A to B, what are the places in which you need to make the change so that the upgrades are successful, right? How to do this impact analysis? Uh, we had actually published a paper in FSC 2019 where we talk about that. Um, but you can actually use these kind of existing analyses to pull up the relevant context in related code and then use that as a prompt for your model, right? So with this, you can get all the way. You could do multiple files or multiple functions, but you still can't do multiple steps, which is how a human developer would solve it, right? So instead of doing one uh, start uh, fix directly at times, you may have to fix it in multiple steps. So how can you go and do that? So for this, I'll introduce the last thing that we looked at, which is static analysis augmented generative agents. And I was really struggling to create a slide for this. Thankfully last week, a paper from Microsoft Research came in where they talk about this in the context of code plan, which is a repository level coding. So you'll see it has all the essential elements from stack. So they have dependency analysis or reachability analysis. They have impact analysis. The additional thing is that model is able to do planning. So it knows what tasks are completed and what are the next code changes that are required in order to fix the model. So the prompt now looks something like this. So these, you have the task, which is to fix the vulnerability. Then there are some com temporal contexts, which has been pulled from RAG. 
Then there's some spatial context, which is pulled from SAG by analyzing what are the related blocks. And then this is the new thing, which is based on a plan. So this is the code that needs to be edited now, which is related to another step that you did earlier by a particular cause, right? And then you ask the model to edit that code. Now, this could be arbitrarily complex. So not just simple calls, it could have number of relations. Uh, and just to give you a sense of like why or how it is uh, useful. Uh, so here is an example where you go from console.writeline, there's API migration to output.writeline, right? But it's done in different steps and all the steps are executed by the model itself. So at first it changes this to output, then it adds another uh, uh, field inside the class. Now an impact analysis would tell us that, okay, the constructor for this class does not initialize this. So then it goes back and adds this to the constructor. Then it realizes, okay, great, this is fine, but uh, my create subscriber is calling the old constructor. So you have to update that. And then finally, for the uh, sync subscriber test class, you have to again update the constructor to include this model, right? And at this point, the, there are no build errors and the model can terminate. Right? So with these, hopefully, you I presented to you with a roadmap of how you can go from a simple code generation all the way to fixing vulnerabilities as a developer would do, and what are the various things that you need to do in order to reach there, right? Now I move on to the last part of my, sorry. Apologies, I move on to the last part of my talk, which is, uh, how actually various communities have uh, taken up uh, Gen AI, right? And why do we think that uh, for development, it's more likely to be automated, right? So if you look at how artists have approached Gen AI, it's, it's been with the fear because they think their craft is more creative and they've used words like theft and stealing and so on. But if you look at how programmers have approached it, they're like, okay, finally, we were really waiting for something like this because there's a lot of tasks that we do which are boring, mundane, and repetitive, and we would rather have a computer do it, right? Another reason is this from McKinsey is the, the economic potential of Gen AI. Uh, so it's a fairly detailed study looking at every single job role and what are the detailed tasks and activities and how much of that can be augmented and uh, automated. And obviously we have some of the things like sales, marketing, customer operations, but they expect a large amount of uh, software engineering tasks to be uh, impacted by Gen AI, right? So given these two things, and this is my final uh, slide or something for you to take away with is, so we have tried DevOps, we've tried DevOps for a while. I think it's time to change and flip the paradigm a little bit. Instead of building security tools for developers, perhaps it's time we start building security tools that uh, developer tools that security folks can use so that we can finally get rid of, you know, uh, having a human or developer in the loop to move towards develop security. That's it, that's my time, thank you. Awesome, thank you for that talk. Um, uh, some questions came in and I encourage the audience, if you do have questions, please ask them in the chat in the Whova, Whova app. Um, one question that came in, how can enterprises ensure that AI generated fixes uh, match or align with their coding standards and their requirements for their business, right? Businesses have those coding and business requirements. Yep. How do we make sure AI does that? Yep. So I think I kind of touched it on a little bit, uh, which is through retrieval, you can actually bring in the context of an existing code base before you do generation. Uh, but if you want more control, one of the ways to do it is just to fine tune on an enterprise's own code base. And that's one of the reasons why open models shine when compared to say a GPT-4. Uh, you could technically take a open model and fine tune it further on your code base where it learns all the uh, nuances and best practices of your code base and then then use that fine tuned model to do the fixing and then it will actually incorporate some of those things yeah nice um and then you you mentioned this this brave new uh, dev less security world um how do you envision that collaboration or collaboration to happen between the developers and security slash ops people in this you know future world you're seeing so what we're trying to aim for is so i mean I, hopefully I showed you that uh, developers are already accepting 33% of suggestions from Copilot, right? So instead of collaborating with a, for a task of like getting your static analysis finding fixed, uh, what we believe is you don't really need to actually collaborate directly with the developer. You'll be able to collaborate with something in the middle which is gonna make autonomous decisions. And it has all the context, it has all the things that are necessary. And through that medium, you will actually collaborate. So developers might still focus on 
uh, writing code for features or tasks which are more creative in nature. Uh, but for some of these more mundane maintenance, fixing, bug fixing, security remediation, you may actually be collaborating with an agent which is doing this uh, orchestration for you, right? So uh, we, if you believe that develop, software development can be replaced, then you certainly can believe that a small portion of that or a large portion of that can also be automated to an extent that you can just work directly uh, with an agent to do it. I mean, at least that's the future we we we, we foresee. Nice. And then with the experience you have in the software industry and the work you've done in the past, um, how do you see the future of AppSec changing, right, and evolving with this new integration of AI and LLMs into the mix? Like, how is AppSec going to shift? So one particular area where we are already seeing uh, impact is just the same thing which we mentioned. So new kinds of software practices lead to new kinds of vulnerabilities. And that is still true. So in fact, I think OWASP has just come up with their version of top 10 uh, for LLMs, uh, which is we are seeing similar kind of things, but like prompt injections, uh, attacks which are specific to LLMs. Uh, in a world where most of the code is, so if you look at last 10 years, where we went from writing monolith apps, uh, proprietary code to assembling you know, open source components, we saw a little bit of shift. So focusing more on your own first party code, we now talk a lot more about supply chain, we talk a lot more about third party code and open source components, right? I think something similar will happen in terms of evolution. So in a world where most of the code is generated or uh, written automatically uh, by uh, human, which is either augmented or uh, completely automated, uh, you'll see, a shift in terms of where the vulnerabilities may come. So we may see more focus on uh, code, which is generated by machines. How do we secure it? How do we uh, maintain it? Uh, and then, uh, I mean, it's, it's gonna be a progression, I believe. So uh, so a lot more code will be, perhaps one of the things that could be of interest is like, is this code really generated by a machine or a human, right? So that's something we don't wonder today, but maybe tomorrow we want to figure that out, right? And then what does it mean for the rest of the code base? Yeah. All right, had another one come in. Um, how do you handle LLM hallucinations, right? We're trying to fix vulner when when you're trying to fix vulnerabilities. What is what if the what if the fix is not really a fix you can rely on? Uh, so there is no easy way to do it. So one reason why we uh, fine tune the like the patch code not on catiness but on specific things like instructions. Uh, is to make sure that it can only do the things that it's been asked to do, right? It may still generate a fix which doesn't fix, there's no guarantee, right? So in the beginning, you may need to have a human in loop. Uh, you rely on it in the same way like you rely today on many other things. You rely on existing test cases, you rely on uh, you know pull requests, merge requests, and things of that nature. Um, but over a period of time, hopefully it can learn enough information to the point that it can do 80 to 90% of the job, which uh, doesn't require human review. And the rest of it, you will still need to uh, rely on it. Yeah. There's no easy way to fix hallucinations. Um, there is uh, one way to do it is to make sure the model is dumb in the sense that it doesn't have open world interpretation. So it, and that's one of the reasons I didn't mention too much here is you can use GPT-4 to do a lot of this, but when you take the response, you'll notice that you have to do a lot of post-processing because at times it would add explanations inside where if you really want to use it as part of a pipeline where you're doing fixes, you don't want that text to come in. You really want only the fix of the code to come in, right? So fine tuning can solve a little bit of that, um, but uh, there is no there's no easy way, especially with models which are more capable. It's hard to control their generation. Makes sense. Yeah, hallucinations, fun aspect of LLVMs. Um, another one come in, what advancements and trends do you anticipate in the next few years? And this is with respect to... I'm assuming with respect to LLVMs and their use with okay. AppSec and bug fixing. Yeah, so one thing which I kind of alluded is, so right now the open models are not nowhere near as capable as GPT-4, right? And they are not even as capable as chat GPT, for example, for a broad spectrum of tasks. Uh, one hope or rather uh, is that uh, we do have a model which is open enough uh, for anybody to download and use, uh, which is as capable as what GPT-4 is today, because that will open a lot of uh, more possibilities for people to experiment and use. Um, uh, other is uh, we are really just scratching the surface in terms of what autonomous agents can do, like with these various co-pilots and things of that nature. And that is that goes beyond LLMs because it involves a lot of aspects around planning and task planning and reasoning, and which LLMs today are not that capable of doing. I just showed you an example, the reversal curse, right? So hopefully uh, 
So one way to avoid that today is what we use is just we use the plain old static analysis and do it in places where we need and give LLM the ability to control that analysis. But in future, uh, if models uh, get better at reasoning, then some of that could be subsumed by the model itself. So you could ask some very complicated, uh, like actually, does this method is called from another place do this? Like you could ask a model a question like this and it would take the repository and make the change directly without having to rely on external tools. So that's the other thing I anticipate. So you just inspired a question in me, so I'm going to cheat and jump the line because I can. Um, if you're using uh, SAST to augment and otherwise uh, improve LLVM output, how do you handle false positives that SAST would then inject into your model? You get what I'm saying? Like it, it, SAST isn't perfect. Yeah. If I'm putting imperfect data into the LVM, what's the downstream yeah. effect? Or how yeah. do you, so, you know, uh, yeah. uh, protect against that? Yeah. So, so far we haven't done what, like we haven't used the output of SAS to uh, train or fine tune a model. What we're using it is really as a tool. So the model controls the SAS and the output, and then it does make some decisions that could be false positives in the sense, like even in the impact analysis, maybe it finds a thing which is not really impacted, but it's conservative and it says it's impacted. And then you make a change and that changes it. Uh, what we do today is to rely on, uh, like, I mean, in terms of the build. So if it is a, it doesn't work, then it's not correct. And then you fail. The build. Otherwise, you still rely on tests. I mean, there is at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to be 100, 100%. We can get to 80, 90%, but at the end of the day, there is always possibility to create cases where uh, you may still need a human in the loop, uh, especially early on, uh, to, to validate the findings. Otherwise, the way to do it is still the same, which is have tests, uh, rely on the build, the compilation output, the existing tests, and then finally a review from a human when the pull request is submitted. Is there a, is there a, this is another question I'm just coming up with because I'm thinking about things now. Is there a, a, a fundamental difference in using interpretive languages versus statically static languages? You know, the Java, the C sharp uh, world well, it, in terms of the you know the ability for for uh, LLMs to reason about those. Uh, so for LLMs, not really because they've been trained on so much of the data. In fact, there's also a lot of benefit of cross uh, languages. So just the fact that you train it on Python, it does much better in benchmarks on Java and uh, uh, C sharp and so on. In terms of using a static analyze as a tool, there is because it's easy to analyze some languages versus other. And uh, like if it's a dynamic type language, there are some things that you may not be able to do that easily. But in terms of LLM, what we have seen is like the same, very same people have applied it for a variety of cases. The only uh, difference there might be that if for a language where there's very little code uh, for training or fine tuning, that's the languages where it might struggle. But I've seen people apply it all the way to like uh, very log or like very, very specific languages for which it may not have been trained explicitly as well. So and you have to think like, why is it possible? Because it's the, the amount of data that is used in pre-training is leaps and bounds more than anything we've used ever in machine learning. It's like it's a trillion tokens. It's like every piece possible piece of code ever written in some sense, right? So when they train on this such large data set, so, uh, it has good uh, general capabilities for coding, regardless of the language, and it carries over with in terms of transfer learning as well. Excellent. And then one last one that came in. Uh, what's the really hard problem that you wish you had a magic wand to fix in LLVMs to be able to address software vulnerabilities? Uh, I think it's around reasoning. So, And it would fix a lot of other things as well, not just software. So hopefully one thing I was able to convey is that a model, a large language model, which is good at doing coding tasks is going to be a large language model in general. That's what we have learned from, like you have to train on both code and then why it happens, we don't really know. Uh, but uh, uh, one hypothesis is that like, you know, programming is like logic and it's like, you know, hurry, hurry, cover of isomorphism. So reasoning is really programming and programming is reasoning. So uh, one thing I would want the models to get better at that is like explicit uh, reasoning. Uh, and maybe the architectures of current models is not suitable for that. It really goes left to right. Uh, but uh, if you could have a model which is capable of reasoning much better, the same way we do program, because what we're doing today is we sometimes we ask the model to generate code, execute the code in a code interpreter, get the output, and then put it back in the model, right? And that works because we are using the code as a way to do reasoning and step-by-step -step, uh, instructions and following what we want to do. That works today. Uh, if that code interpreter part could be subsumed by the model itself, I think then you could do a lot more things uh, explicitly rather than use it either as a function from GPT-4 or as an explicit API. So I would want models to get better at uh, uh, actual uh, reasoning in terms of uh, planning and uh, things of that nature. That makes sense. And then uh, one other one that came in, just what's, what's next for uh, 
patched codes. Like, what do you? What is your next step? You've talked about how you've improved models. You've done a lot of training. The the using SAST, using the the reg. I can't remember what that stood for. I remember you saying it. Like, how, how do? Like, what's next? What's the next interesting thing that you think has potential to even move the needle farther? So. One thing we have done is because of our background, we focus explicitly on vulnerabilities, but this goes beyond vulnerabilities. I mean, there are many other cases. So except for pure code generation where you are, and I'll again take the same analogy I took from SCA versus SAS, right? So what we saw is people earlier used to write a lot of business logic, like 80, 90% of code was first party things you wrote. Now it's flipped, like 80, 90% of the code is third party. Something similar might happen where in future, like five or 10% of the code is what is human written but the 80, 95% that the code can actually be automated. And most of it is repetitive. Maybe it's bug fixing, maybe it's more maintenance tasks, API upgrades, like in general patching, not just related to vulnerabilities, right? So uh, what we showed probably is like a roadmap of uh, how you could approach this, but you could apply it in multiple places with code maintenance, uh, API migrations, uh, fixing other kinds of bugs, which are much simpler, hopefully, uh, to the extent that we can automate most of the tasks that a developer does, uh, and what is left over is just really something that they have to do on their own. Yeah. Nice. So you, you hopefully won't be, uh, well, I shouldn't say hopefully, but you won't be out of a job anytime soon. You've still got a little bit of work to do. <laughs> well, sure. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that the, the, the better the mousetrap, the smarter the mice get all the time. Exactly. Uh, that was all the questions we got. I really appreciate this. This was super interesting. It was interesting to see the the evolution and the different uh, iterations that LLMs have gone through over time to try to get us closer and closer to a, a magic button to fix all our phones. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt.